I love what I see God doing here at Zeal Church, and why would anybody want to be anywhere else? I've, I was in Fort Myers, Florida yesterday morning speaking, hopped on a plane, got here at about 10 o'clock last night, which would be 12 o'clock midnight, Fort Myers time, and I fly out to Orange County tomorrow, but I drank five shots of espresso. So I am here, I am present, I am with you guys. I can totally do this. So excited, I see some beautiful friends of ours, Lisa and Dr. Doug Weiss, and their beautiful family. I, I know there's a lot of you that are here, and I just, it's so, I wanna hug all of you. So find me after service. I am gonna show you my family because it has been growing a lot. So go ahead and throw those cute boys up here. Okay, Alexander, hallelujah, is engaged. Alexander, yeah. He's marrying an Australian. We imported, we imported. So there's Alexander, there is Austin and Jessica. They're gonna be here next service. Arden and Christian, and they are expecting their first baby end of July. They're having a boy. So we're gonna be equal now. We're gonna have three grandsons and three granddaughters. There's sweet Lizzie, Sophia hugging my husband of 40 years this October, John Bevere. Addison and Julie, they know and love you guys. They're beautiful children. They are amazing. They send their love. I talked to Addison this morning. He called me for Mother's Day love. And then we have Scarlett. I have another grandchild. There she is. Scarlett is so fat. They do not expect her to ever crawl. Uh, Jess took her to the pediatrician. She's nine months. She's like, she's not crawling. I mean, we've put things under her stomach to try to get her to roll forward, and she's like, no. But if you saw her thighs, you would understand. She can't lift that, she just can't. Yeah, she's, she's amazing. She has two faces. She, her resting face is a judgy face. Yeah, there, she's, she just judges, like, why should I smile? Uh, and then she has a happy face. But that is Scarlett, I love her so much. I love being a mother. I love being a grandmother, and I'm just going to tell you I love being a godmother to Octavia and Brandon. And you think, what is a godmother? Well, a godmother is when you get a Sicilian on your side. So I have dual citizenship. Uh, my husband is Italian, but I am Sicilian, and I have dual citizenship, so I just kind of capitalize on the whole Sicilian theme. Uh, I do want to talk about a couple books because I know some of you guys forgot to buy a Mother's Day gift for your wife. Okay, I just launched a devotional Tuesday. It hasn't even been out a week. And it's called Fiercely Loved, God's Wild Thoughts About You. How many of you know it is time you change the way you think God is thinking about you? God is not thinking thoughts to disqualify you, to distance you, to disengage from you. God has good thoughts, Amen. treasured thoughts, precious thoughts. This is what David had a revelation of in the wilderness. In Psalm 139, he wrote, how precious are your thoughts about me, about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. What does that tell us? That tells us that God has treasured, precious, good thoughts towards you. And they're innumerable, innumerable. But it's not just that, it's constant. It's constant. And so we need to change the way that we think God is looking at us. Because when we change the way we think God is looking at us, we change the way we look at everybody else. How many of you know we got a lot of meanness going on in the body of Christ? Yeah, because when people feel judged, they judge. And so we need to be a people who understand that God wasn't this angry God in the Old Testament who sent his son to die for us, and Jesus was like, please be nice to them. Please change your mind. No, he sent his son to reveal his heart. And so God is for us. And so it is the goodness and the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Kindness is not an endorsement of sin, it is a doorway. And so we need to start being kind 
in the body of Christ, and we need to start with each other. I'm going to be preaching to you out of Godmothers, but I added something in earlier this morning because I feel like God is doing something, something significant here. And so I want to open up from the passage, John chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. It's the wedding at Canaan. It says, the next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Canaan in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities. So Jesus' mother told him, they have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. My time has not yet come. But his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, though of course the servants knew, because God always lets his servants know what's going on, he called the bridegroom over. A host usually serves the best wine first. He said then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine, but you have kept the best until now. I love this city, and I have been in this city for decades. I still have a place in this city. I still have an office in this city. But I am here to tell you that God has saved his best for now. Yes. Yes. And I am here as a mama telling you it is time. It is time for us to stop calling water wine. It is time for us to do whatever the master tells us to do. I read this scripture and I remember my boys the first time they read it, they used it as an excuse to call me woman. They're like, hey woman, woman. And they're like, Jesus calls his mom woman. I'm like, you're not Jesus. You're not Jesus. Jesus wants to call me woman. That's fine. You call me mom. You call me mom. And it's interesting that Mary saw lack and spoke to her son and said, hey, hey, they're out. They're out. And he was like, hey, it's not my time. Okay. Mama's no timing. And you often won't know timing until you become a mom. I remember when I was pregnant with my first son, they didn't do sonograms back then. It was like hit and miss. You didn't know what you were going to have, when you were going to have it, how much it was going to weigh. You were living in a constant state of confusion. And I remember as I got more uncomfortable, I was like, I, I think I'm further along. I think I'm nine months. I was claiming nine months at seven and a half months. And my doctor was like, I, I, don't, think, I don't think you're that far along. But things get uncomfortable when it's time. And I remember going to the doctor's office and I was two weeks past due. I thought, I am never going to go into labor. And he said, you probably aren't. We're going to induce you tomorrow. And I went into this induction in Dallas, Texas. Now I need to paint a little bit of a picture for you. In Dallas, when I found out I was gonna have a baby the next day, I went and got a French manicure. Yeah, that's what you do in Dallas. And then I also, I also had blonde hair back then. Why anyone who looks like an Arab would have blonde hair, I'm not sure why I did that. But I went, I had my highlights done. I had my French manicure. I got up for my induction, showed up full on jewelry, full on makeup. All the nurses looked at me, went into a huddle. They're like, I'm not taking her. She has no idea what she is here for. And a, a mean, a mean, grumpy nurse came out and she was like, take off all your jewelry, stop smiling, get in there, <laughs> strip down, put on that, that gown that exposes your backside and get ready to hurt. I mean, this lady was so mad. And then she checks me and she tells me, you shouldn't even be here. You're going to be induced and you're going to be laboring all day and I'm going to go home tonight and I'm going to sleep and I'm going to come back. 
and tomorrow morning you're going to still be here. I remember looking at John and saying, get her out of the room. And John was like, let's be Christians. I'm like, I don't want to be a Christian right now. I want to have a baby. 12 hours of agony with the mean nurse. But after 12 hours, something happened. A shift changed and a new nurse came along and she looked at my chart where my contractions were not even registering anymore they were a minute and a half long and 30 seconds in between them she looked at me and said baby we're gonna make it so it doesn't hurt anymore at that point I sold out my husband the one I had made promises like you have to promise no matter how I beg for an epidural say no say no and I was like he wouldn't let me get an epidural she's like Sir, sir, you're going to have to leave the room. Like, I, holding the nurse. I thought we were going to be friends after my labor. I thought she was going to call me and ask me to lunch. I remember saying, can, can you just hold me while they do it? She was like, absolutely. I had Addison an hour and a half later. Why? Because when women are in the company of evil midwives, they don't bring forth babies. But God is saying to you, the shift has changed and you are in the company of women who want to see your pain have purpose they want to see what is in you be brought forth God is waking up the heart of mothers mothers see we got mentors mentors are good but mentors tend to reproduce themselves mothers don't reproduce themselves each and every one of my pregnancies I said Oh God, nothing like me, please, nothing like me, nothing. I want new, improved version. I don't want my children to make my same mistakes. I don't want them to live with my fears and my failures. Every one of my kids, I wanted to go further and farther. I remember God saying to me, Lisa, your children will inherit one of two things, either my promises or your fears. You need to face off what your limitations so it doesn't come on the next generation. See, mamas will bless other people in the very areas that they were only cursed. Mamas will speak life where other people only spoke death. Why? Because mothers have the ability to see it now and in the future. Oh, it's so true. I'm going to see my second born son at the next service, oh, but I can still see him as a two year old. I still see him riding a horse, this little plastic horse, yelling to integrity music, rejoice Africa. There's no one like God, no one like God, yelling in his Mickey Mouse underwear, and then one day coming down and saying, Why does no one like God? Oh, see, there's a moment that are woven in our lives as mothers. Because of the redemption of God and our family, I have four sons who love God with all of their heart and are living better lives than John and I. And I had somebody ask me, okay, tell me your prayers. And I said, you know, I let John cover the prayer part. And I covered the training part. You have to train your children. You have to understand, mamas, you are not their maid. You are their mother. Not long after we moved to Colorado, I remember having a revelation that my boys didn't really care about me doing their laundry. I would wash it, fold it, put it on their bed. All they had to do was move it off the bed, put it in a dresser. But no, no, that was too hard. They had to, they had to like put it in with dirty clothes and throw it into the hamper and bury it. I would find buried clean clothes among crunchy socks. How, guys, how do you do that? How do you make your socks? I've never had crunchy socks in my entire life. And so I remember my boys came home from school and the psycho mom had dumped all of the clothes in, a, in a, like the center of the room. And I said, guys, I forgot. I'm not your maid. I'm your mother. I'm gonna train you how to do laundry right now. I'm not gonna have your wives mad at me. So many women, so many women are trying to train their husbands wow. and love their children. We are called to love our husbands wow. and train our children. Wow. Wow. Because those kids leave one day. 
And, and John Bevere is living his best life right now. He has me all to himself. He is, he is loving it. Okay, so it's time. And it's time for the mamas to wake up. It's time for them to have a heart for the daughters. It's time for them to have a heart for the sons. It's time for them to have a heart for their husbands. And you know, I had an awareness very early on uh, in, in my Christian walk that I was going to be ministering to women. And so I tried to pick my hero. I was like, my hero is not Esther. I do not want to be a concubine. My hero, <laughs> my hero is Deborah. Deborah is the boss of the world. Deborah sits under a palm tree and judges people. I want to be Deborah. Oh, some of you do that on your toilet with your phone, but I wanted to sit under a palm tree and judge people. I was like, she is the prophetess and the judge. Highest spiritual authority, highest governmental authority, yes, Deborah. But then I looked at context and I found out that Deborah became a judge after Israel had been ruled 80 years by a guy named Ehud. And Ehud, it said, ruled them as a judge with a cattle prod. I don't know what that looks like. And then the people were like, we're scared. We're going to be obedient to the Lord. God blessed them 80 years of prosperity. But when he dies, the people went right back to where their heart was. The cattle prod was gone. And they're like, remember how we used to set up altars everywhere? Remember that sex worship religion? Let's go back to Balmelach. Let's go, let's, go, let's go back to that. And God's like, really? You guys are going to do this again? Because if you look at the children of Israel, they obey God. He blesses them. Then they're like, no, I think this is all about us. They go away from God. He sends an oppressor. They cry out. He rescues them. They do the whole pattern again and again and again. And if you and I could look at our lives and we could look at the graph and the pattern of our lives, we might actually find out that we do some of the same things. Deborah inherited a people, oppressed and broken. I begin to wonder if maybe they said, yeah, sure, what's a woman going to do? Let them have a woman judge. In Judges chapter 4, verse 2, it says, and the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sesera, who lived in Haresh Hagoim. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and he oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. The people of God do not do well in seasons of prosperity. We actually do better in seasons of hardship. Struggle yeah. is yeah. strengthening. Wow. It is. So what's happening during this 20 years of oppression? Well, Israel was devastated, discouraged, isolated. It said that all the trade routes were cut off, so nothing was coming in and nothing was going out. It also says that the people of Israel wouldn't even go out and work their own fields right. because they were afraid of being attacked. So they no longer had purpose. They are isolated. And what happens when people have no purpose and they're isolated? Oh, we're seeing it right now in our culture. Infighting, infighting. Everybody attacking one another. Everybody fighting with one another. They forget that the enemy is not in the house. They think that the enemy is in the house, but you and I know we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness and high places that exalt themselves, exalt themselves against us knowing God. They begin to fight. They begin to fight and bigger. What is going on in the body of Christ right now? I'm telling you, I want to spank everybody and hug them. I mean, I'm like spank and then hug or hug and then spank. I don't know which one needs to happen. I, I turned on a Instagram today and some guys like saying, oh, and the church does this and the church does that and the church wants people to commit suicide. I've, I felt like saying, and I want to slap you. Because no, there are some people that are crazy. 
But the big C, Church of Jesus Christ, is not that way. And the people that most people are describing, I don't even know. I don't even know. And you know what? God is the one cleaning up his bride. He says he washes her with the water of the word to evoke her beauty. We better not be caught pulling up her skirt and showing her mess. We need to actually speak the word. We need to prophesy the church that will be instead of criticize the church that is right now. Oh, I get it. There's stuff that's going on that needs to be addressed. God is sifting and he is shaking so that what cannot be shaken will be established. He is also shifting. And I don't, but, but God begins to, spank, okay, I'll just tell the story. We have, we have our fourthborn. He's a baby. That means he was hardly ever spanked. And I remember John finally one day said, Arden, you're getting spanked. And the other three boys had revival. Yay, Arden's getting spanked. Arden's getting spanked. Arden's getting spanked. And John was like, well, now I'm not going to spank him. And we're like, what? No. He's like, no, because you guys were all so happy. Okay, do you know God kind of does that with his kids too? You got you to gotta humble yourself. When God begins to judge, we look at ourselves. Okay, and if you feel like you're supposed to disengage from something, disengage from it. Don't put it on your social media. Because my Bible says I'm going to give an account for every idle word. Every idle word. I've been married 40 years. I've been serving God for 42 years. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of things I would have died to defend that I don't even believe anymore. So you want to be careful about putting things out there that you can't take back. Because God doesn't have a delete button. He remembers. So we need to be careful. So infighting, infighting. We, we can't have that. The body cannot attack itself. We need to be one. One. There's things my husband and I don't even agree on, but that doesn't mean we're not one. Right. So all of this different fighting going on, I don't know what caused Deborah to finally snap, but there came a moment where she was like, that's it. It's not going to work with me being a judge. It's not going to work with me being a prophetess. I know for me, when my boys were young, John would, you know, be calling home from a ministry trip, and I'm crazy woman with the kids, and he, they're all yelling and screaming, and I put the phone against my chest, and I yelled at the boys, when I get off this phone, I'm spanking everyone. And John would be like, wait, did you just say you were spanking all of the boys? I said, I, yes. Yeah, you don't get to talk about that because you're not here. He said, but are you really going to do it? I was like, no, I'm not really going to do it. He said, so you're lying to our children. I said, yes, I am lying <laughs> to our children. I don't know if Deborah just was like, I'm spanking everyone. I don't know what happened. But the way the New King James puts it is village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. Life had completely shut down down. Their communities were broken. People were afraid to dream, afraid to live, afraid to hope. But enough is enough. The NET says warriors were scarce. Now, isn't that interesting? It goes from village life has ceased to warriors were scarce. Warriors were scarce. They were scarce in Israel until you arose, Deborah, until you arose a motherly protector in Israel. Do you know God talks about himself as a motherly protector? Like a mama bear robbed of its cubs. Like a lioness. I'll tear your heart out. Now that's not, that's not talking about people. That's talking about principalities. Right. We don't tear up people. Okay, I just want to be clear on that. Okay, the NCV reads, there were no warriors. So now we've gone from scarce warriors to no warriors. There were no warriors in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose to be a mother to Israel. But this is my absolute favorite version. Message paraphrase. Warriors became fat and sloppy. No fight left in them, so they played video games. Then you, Deborah, <laughs> rose up. You got up a mother in Israel. I don't know if there were no warriors or just some fat guys left over from COVID, but everything changed when Deborah arose. Not a prophetess, not a judge, 
a mother. Because mothers often have this connection with who is supposed to carry it. Do you remember? We've got, we've got Jacob, we've got Esau. And Isaac liked Esau. But mama knew, no, it's not Esau. It's Jacob. And Jacob's going to go through a hardship, but he's going to come out after wrestling with God, a prince. So she sends for a prince in exile. Sent some men for Barak, the son of Abinath, from Kadesh of Tali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulon. I believe that God is asking us to begin to, has God not spoken to you? And you say, well, I don't got 10,000. Okay, I'm going to tell you. There is a word. And there is, I, I love that this church is founded on prayer. Because you don't understand what happens in the spirit when the people of God all decide to say the same thing. When the people of God gather, it says nothing is impossible. We need to begin to prophesy, not what is, but what could be. But when she calls this prince out of exile, do you know 20 years of oppression can do something to a man? He had forgotten who he was. And he said, I'm not going to go unless you go with me. And see, if I had been Deborah, I would have said, uh, excuse me, do you know who you're talking to? I am the prophetess and I am the boss of your world. As the judge, you do what I tell you to do. But Deborah didn't do that because Deborah knows what true leaders do. True leaders don't pull rank. They lend strength. She said, all right, I'll go with you. See, sometimes we need the mamas to go with the prince. Sometimes we need to go together. And then y'all know it's a crazy mess. We've got like chariot wheels falling off and, you know, people like slaughtering each other. But I don't want to talk about JL and that mess. I want to talk about the intimate connection between earth and heaven. In Judges 5, verse 20, it says, From the heavens, the stars fought from their courses. They fought against Sesra. The river Kishon swept them away. The age-old river, the river Kishon, march on, my soul, be strong. March on, my soul, be strong. Do you know you can speak to your soul? No, you guys, you have to understand this. You can speak to your soul. David said, soul, why are you downcast? Oh, why? Put your hope in God. Anytime you put your hope in something that can be taken from you, you are at risk of being downcast. We have to speak to our soul. Guys, I just finished going through menopause. During menopause, there is a mean woman living in your head. She says things like, punch your husband in the face. She says, throw a fit at the airlines. I'm not wearing a mask. She says all sorts of things. And I'm like, no, evil woman, you are not taking me emotional hostage. You got to renew your mind. You got to know what God's word is saying. How many of you know that we live in a time period where a lot of things sound good but feel wrong? You have to have the word of God to discern or you are just going to live in suspicion and fear. And discernment isn't just about noting wrong things. Discernment is the ability to see the light in the distance in somebody else's life. I'm so thankful that people discern the call of God on my life when I did not look like I should be called by God. Wow. I'm so thankful that when I said I don't feel yeah. like I fit in anywhere, he said to me, you were created to begin, not belong. He said to me, you and John are the point of an arrow. You have to stay strong because you're not everything, but you will take a lot of the pressure, but you have to not cave. I don't know 
what God is saying to you, but I do know what you have to say to yourself. Be strong and of good courage, for the Lord your God is with you. Be strong and of good courage, for the Lord your God is with you. Be strong and of good courage, for the Lord your God is with you. Listen, when I lived up a little bit north, I would tell my boys, everybody, everybody, get in the suburban, get in the suburban, and they'd be like, Oh no, are we running errands? How many errands are we going to run? How long are we going to be gone? Addison would please, mom, please let me just babysit. I was like, no, last time I let you babysit, you put Alexander in a dog crate. You are not allowed to babysit. Everybody get in the suburban. Oh, we don't love it, we don't love it. And I'd say, I know the plans I have for you. (laughs) Plans for good and not for harm. Plans to get you food and school supplies. Get in the suburban. You guys, how many of you know that God is doing a new thing? God is doing a new thing and it looks nothing like the old thing. God is doing a new thing and some of you are like, okay, what's going on? And God says, for I know the plans I have for you. You're like, okay, great, tell them. For I know the plans I have for you. Okay, when is the plan? For I know the plans I have for you. Who is the plan with? For I know the plans I have for you. That's all he ever says. I'm just going to tell you that right now. But you can either argue, complain, fight, cancel people, or you can get in the car and enjoy the ride. God is doing something, something powerful, strong, strategic, and it's gonna take the old and the young, it's gonna take the male and the female, it's gonna take the mothers and the fathers, it's gonna take the sons and the daughters to prophesy. And I believe as we begin to prophesy, we're going to see signs and wonders and miracles. And I believe that God wants it to be a corporate thing, not an exclusive individual thing. I believe that you and I are prophetic by function of the timing of our birth. So can you stand to your feet? I'm going to pray a Godmother prayer over all of you. I believe that God wants to release some things. I believe, like Pastor Brandon said, there's some mamas. There's some mamas that you need to cry out. You need to cry out for what you carry, and you need to cry out for this next generation. I want you to understand this is a house that celebrates both men and women, both mothers and fathers, and sons and daughters. This is a house where all ages are welcome. This is a house where you can come to the table because God wants to listen in on the conversations that happen in this house. And see, for too long, we just had conversations with people that look like us, think like us, talk like us, live like us. And God is saying, if you're going to have the right conversations with the right people, they need to be diverse. And so this is a house where conversations are welcome, but conversations that honor God, honor God and speak to future. All right. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that there is sacred space. I just thank you for release of your anointing to prophesy. Father, I thank you for an impartation to stand on the earth and release the mandate of heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done is a prophetic prayer. And so Father, I thank you that your kingdom is come and your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And everybody that agrees say, amen and amen. It's my privilege and my incredible honor to bless this house, bless your families, bless what God has begun, begun.